Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you. Understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. And automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Words always give me melodic ideas, also rhythmic ideas because of speech rhythm in me. I, I, I walk around when I hear someone in the street and I hear them talk, I, I notate it in my head what, what it would look like on a page. Time signature, what the rhythm would be, how, you know, if you, if you think of a pulse behind what people are saying. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, June Thomas. And I am your other host, Isaac Butler. Hi, Isaac. It is always a pleasure to see you and to talk with you. But tell me, whose voice did we hear at the top of the show? We heard the voice of composer and jazz legend Anthony Davis. And why did you want to speak with him right now? Well, part of the reason is that, like, he's a titan in his field. And his press reps approached us and said, hey, do you want to interview Anthony Davis? And any time you have the opportunity to interview someone of his stature, intelligence, and artistry, you should take him, right? <laughs> but the reason why they they brought it to our attention is that his first opera, X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, which premiered in the, the mid-'80s and has sort of not been remounted very often, now has a new production that began in Detroit and then bowed at the Metropolitan Opera this fall. And so since that was coming back, it was a good opportunity to speak with him. Amazing. I cannot wait to hear that conversation. But tell me, Isaac, is there some exclusive content just for Slate Plus members? And if so, what will they hear? You know there is, June. There always is. And uh, so it turns out that Anthony Davis is a big sci-fi head, and so am I. And so when I learned that uh, he is working on a long, gestating opera adaptation of Ursula Le Guin's extraordinary The Left Hand of Darkness, I just had to know more. Uh, so we talked about science fiction and... Samuel Delaney and Ursula Le Guin and other new wave authors and uh, some of the challenges of adapting a work in which people change physical sex for an opera in which people have to sing in a specific vocal range. Just hearing about that challenge, I just know that the great mezzo Jamie Barton, who's been a guest on Working, would love to be involved with that. What a treat. If you're a member of Slate Plus, you'll hear that conversation at the end of the episode. And if you aren't, it's super, super easy to join. As a Slate Plus member, you get to hear extra segments on this show and others like the Culture Gap Fest and Amicus. You'll get bonus episodes of podcasts like Slow Burn and Decoder Ring. And of course, you'll never hit a paywall on Slate.com. To learn more, go to Slate.com slash Working Plus. OK, let's hear Isaac's conversation with Anthony Davis. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Anthony Davis, thank you so much for coming on to Working to talk about your process. Oh, thank you. So 
This season, a new production of your opera X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, bowed at the Metropolitan Opera, and and it had its premiere almost 40 years ago at New York City Opera. And of course, before that, you were mostly known as a jazz composer, pianist, and band leader, and not for sort of the kind of narrative work that you're known for today. I'm just curious if we can go back in time for a moment of what made you decide to move into doing more narrative-driven music for the stage? Well, I think after X, I was hooked. <laughs> it becomes kind of almost an addictive thing, you know, because you, the idea of thinking about music and, and drama and storytelling, it's something that uh, attracted me. I mean, it attracted me from the beginning when I got into music. I mean, I was, always, I was very interested in, when I was in high school and into college, I was a writer. I wrote right. a novel, I wrote poetry, I and I was very interested in kind of merging these these different worlds. I was always a, a musician as well and playing music, but it's something that that uh, you know really really came naturally to me. Hmm. Where did X specifically begin? Do you remember the origins of the project? Yeah, I do vividly. We, I, of course, my brother and I have different recollections of it, but my brother was in a play of uh, El Haj Malik playing the role of Malcolm X in the play. And uh, I went to the performance and backstage after the performance, he said to me, you know, that Malcolm X from the autobiography, you could see that Malcolm X would be a great story for a musical because you could capture the musical styles, they say, of the 40s, all the way through the avant-garde measures of the avant-garde and Coltrane, et cetera, you know, Albert Eiler, et cetera, in the 60s as being parallel to the political development Malcolm's coming becoming a, a political leader. I thought that was that was really interesting, but then I thought Malcolm was a tragic hero. And so I thought that the form should be an opera. Mm-hmm. Your primary collaborators are members of your family. Your, your brother Christopher is credited with the story. And of course, your cousin Tulani, who's a wonderful poet, uh, wrote the libretto. Uh, when did she get involved in it? And what is it like to have your primary collaborators be your relatives? Well, that happened relatively early in the process. I mean, my brother had started thinking about a story treatment, a scenario for the opera. And Talani and I had been collaborating for a number of years, working with poetry and music. I'd done a lot of performances with her reading her poetry and playing. I played piano behind it. And then we did a show with, um, I worked with Anazaki Shange and mm. Talani and Jessica Hagedorn on a show called Where the Mississippi Meets the Amazon. And so this was the kind of part of, uh, you know, this whole uh, choreo poem idea that was happening in New York in the, in the early eighties and the late seventies. And that, and so I was very much a part of that, you know, working with, I worked with Talani and with Saki. Mm. So we already had a kind of collaboration happening. And so it was very natural for me to move from playing music behind your poetry to setting the poetry to music. Mm. Yeah, I'm curious, you know, what the new challenges were for you in setting language to music and specifically to setting language that is based in character and narrative. What did you have to learn and how did you learn how to do that? Well, I kind of learned on the fly. I think that the, the way I work is I sing everything. Mm. <laughs> so so I, I think I, I thought it was important to physically feel what it was like to sing the words and make that as natural as I could. And then at the same time, also thinking about every scene, sort of a different room, a different place, a different musical character that you could create, uh, you know, different musical space. So for example, Boston was using the you know, jazz of the forties, of the you know, inspired by artists from Lewis Jordan to Cab Calloway to, right. to accept, you know, so and this idea also, it's kind of blues variations are going on in that scene. And, so, and other scenes, it was, it was much more meditative. So I you know, thought about, you know, of course, Coltrane's music, modal music of the, of the early 60s, you know, when I got into Act Two, et cetera. And then also, I, before I wrote opera, I wrote music for dance. I did mm-hmm. a lot of music for dance. And that helped me a great deal because thinking about the performers is being in in space on a stage in movement and action and thinking about how the music can motivate action and mo- right. motivate the movement so that the feeling of movement and feeling of the 
propulsion in the music. That was really important. It's not, maybe that's less important to some other opera composers, but for me, rhythm and the momentum and rhythmic drive was very central to, uh, to how I created X. So when you were writing X, did the specific scene start with Tulani sending you libretti fragments or were you two working together in a room or did you start with music? Like, like how did the piece actually develop from its origins? Well, it developed all kinds of ways. I had some preconceived music that actually came from some of my dance collaboration music. I mean, I had written a piece called Walk Through the Shadow that was done in my uh, on the album Hemispheres, which was uh, my collaboration. Melissa Fenley, a wonderful dancer and choreographer. We did it, bam. And it's very meditative. It's based on the 23rd Psalm. And so when I when I look, thought about the story, I thought, well, you know, maybe that's, some of that could be in the Mecca music in his pilgrimage to Mecca. So I sort of expanded upon that. The, the, what I, some of the dance material that I originally did earlier in the eighties, it gave me sort of a, a way to start. So I didn't feel like I was out, out in the ozone, you know, somewhere. Right. Yeah, totally. (laughs) But then, then, you know, as I, as I kept working and then as I got the libretto and I saw the flow of the words. The words were inspiring. Words always give me melodic ideas, also rhythmic ideas because of speech rhythm. And you know, I, I, I walk around when I hear someone in the street and I hear them talk, I, I, can, I, I notate it in my head what, what it would look like on a page. Oh, really? You know, like like what the time signature would be? Yeah, time and... signature, what the rhythm would be, how the, the, oh, they used four against three here and it was mm. this, that, that. You know, it was like, you know, if, if you think of a pulse behind what people are saying. So right, totally. So that's something I I was fascinated with, and uh, so in creating X, that you know that was be- beginning, and then to, as the libretto, I got the libretto, it, it began to really take shape. Then I began, mm. uh, and my first impulse when I when I get the libretto is I put the libretto on the piano and I just play through the whole thing. You know, I, I imagine what the music will be for the whole Act One. You know, mm. just but kind of a sketchy improvisation around it, and then. That gives me a kind of general idea, and then then I develop it. Do you do you record that improvisation, or is no, it just the, the parts that you do? You trust your subconscious to filter through what works and doesn't. Yeah, it, it, if it's not good, I won't remember it. Hopefully, got it, <laughs> got, it got it, totally. <laughs> if it's good, I will remember it. I mean, that that's usually my editor. If I remember something, it, it it's usually okay. But if, if, if I don't, then it's usually okay too. <laughs> <laughs> um. As you've mentioned, the music for the opera blends a bunch of different traditions together, and it also moves sort of through time through different jazz idioms. Um, there's also traditional opera influences in there. Um, I think I read somewhere that the first opera you really listened to was Berg's Wojciech. Uh, Wojciech, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, I feel like you can tell that, that that's an important opera to you in, in there and in, in parts. I'm just curious about, like, obviously those traditions live inside you, but it's one thing to do that, and it's another thing to squish them together <laughs> and to make a piece of music that involves both. And, and I'm just curious about how you conceptualized and thought through doing that. Well, Berg, I mean, I, I was in college. I went to see, they did a... But uh, at Yale, they did a concert version of some of what's that, and it just wiped me out. I was just, I couldn't believe the music. But but I think also because of how m- the music is so tied to the drama, and then the startling use of tonality that happens when, when all of a sudden, after all this other music, there's something very simple happens, you know, it's, mm-hmm. and that devastating impact that has. So that that's something that, that I thought, I always thought of. You know the the contrast, the idea of that tonality can be startling thing too. But also, I you know I love Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn and and Charles Mingus was a huge influence on on me musically. I yeah. uh, and and putting those worlds together, I never think of them as separate. Right. I don't think I'm doing genre. Like think of a genre. I mean, I think that you try to find. My my music is influenced by all these things, and so I, I I just feel free to draw upon 
what my own proclivities are, what I'm attracted to musically. And I don't really think about it. I, I always, I, I actually, sometimes I discover it later. I said, oh God, I was doing that. I mean, it's because it, it, I think that you're also looking what how the music fits the moment. What mm -hmm. what is how to serve the drama and serve the drama in the moment, and what what you're trying to accomplish in in the music, and also not just as a fixed thing, but also as a dynamic thing. How how it moves from one thing to another, you know mm -hmm. how it may you makes a transition from one thing to another. So, for example, in Bo the Boston, you know, I was thinking of Louis Jordan, uh, Nat King Cole, all these things. You know, also things of that period of the late '40s. I was trying to capture in the '40s. Um, but then when they actually go into the dance, all of a sudden I, I, I found myself uh, thinking about gamelan music for some reason. I mean, hmm. I had had this music that was inspired by Balinese music, you know, because I thought thought about the this kind of dislocation of the the dance being in a more com a different a complex meter that takes you out of the time and place into this other space that's about you know the kind of escape that the ballroom represented the the uh, and and uh, so then a way that it, it would allow me to abstract from that time and place into some other space so actually let, let's just take a moment and listen to a little bit of that dance hall song uh this is from x obviously from the 2022 recording that you did with the boston modern orchestra project What did you take from gamelan music? Was it the rhythmic structure or was it, you know, the the chords or, you know, what is it that found its way into that? Well, that well the rhythmic structure, I couldn't do harmony because of the microtonal. It's not. Right. Was, yeah, exactly. That's, but that's, I think about the, what it was, that I remember going to a Wyang performance at Wesleyan. I, was, I actually studied South Indian music, not Balinese music, but I, went, I would go to the gamelan performances. And I was really excited because it, it was about rhythmic drama, rhythm drama, how rhythm, you know, those great moments with the shadow puppets and stuff and how rhythm drives the drama. So I thought of creating an X of creating a rhythmic drama, rhythm drama, that rhythm is a fundamental, the way Wagner used harmony and light motifs, I use rhythm as as a kind of building block of what, what where the drama comes together. And as the, rhythm, the polyrhythms become more complex, it's more rhythmic tension. And then mm -hmm. when it comes together, it's a release. So I feel that that was, that was a lot of it. And, and Exodus has a very almost mathematical framework to it. I, I wanted to talk briefly a little bit about the Mecca sequence in X, which is just an extraordinarily powerful and also much more peaceful moment of music yeah. uh, uh, in the show. You mentioned that some of its roots were in earlier dance pieces you had done. Did you look at Arabic religious music or anything like that as part of your research process for creating that that song or well it's very interesting because what well, first of all the, the only part of the Quran that you can set to music is the morning prayer right I mean otherwise it's sacrilegious it's, that's not done right. so so in doing our research we realized that I saw I was really worried about a certain kind of appropriation I mean I was going to do kind of music that came from my ideas, you know, my own setting of it. I mean, mm -hmm. actually in the performance at the Met, it was very interesting. You know, Kamir El Safar, when he played his trumpet solo, he's actually playing the melody of the morning prayer in a solo right. over the pattern. So so it's very, very that's that was exciting to me because he brought that from his his culture, et cetera, you know. And I had very close Muslim friends like Abdul Wadud, great cellist who played with me a lot and and I talked to, spoke with him, and he would pronounce the words and thinking about the words and everything. Hmm. It was funny when I first did the w workshop of the opera. All these people complained that the producers that the mecca scene was too long. And at that point, I hadn't had the morning prayer in the beginning. I just had the pattern, and then the I have come so far. A Monday, the aria comes in. Okay. But what I realized that it was so different from the music of the rest of the opera that you had to be in it more. That mm -hmm. that you in a way you had to leave the 
other stuff behind leave the the other world behind which is what are we doing it's going to mecca leave that world behind and embrace this new world you had to so you had to let the world sit so when i did the fi final version of it when they were saying i should make it shorter i made it longer because i <laughs> add, added the morning prayer to it and, and and but but they said oh it works so much better i said yeah because i made it longer right <laughs> so it's it's funny so like what they knew was that something wasn't working, working exactly. but they didn't know the solution they didn't know what well, it was they and didn't you know had what the solution was and and and, and that, that's the thing you have to trust yourself about because sometimes people will know what's wrong but their mm -hmm. solution isn't what should happen because yeah. you know and, and that that's something i realized when i when i was doing it and, and when i it was so exciting when i discovered that and we did the morning prayer and i put that in that then it became it's a special moment. And then when Robert, what the uh, designer did with the, in the Met, when the, and the joy, where the lights come down and mm -hmm. it's great, it's a, inspired by a, the mosque in, in Cairo. Right. Yeah. So that was, it was so it's beautiful and so otherworldly, you know? Yeah. We'll be back with more of Isaac's conversation with Anthony Davis. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results, that's SAP Business AI. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we offer advice about Creative Dilemma. So please tell us your creative challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com. You can also, and yes, we would really love this, send us a voice memo to that address or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK and leave a message. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to Isaac's conversation with Anthony Davis. You mentioned the extraordinary Amir El Safar, who's just a, a brilliant trumpeter and great band leader and composer on his oh, own. Oh, yes, um, yeah, he, yeah. He's one of many jazz musicians in that pit, including the, the incredible Mike Fay on trombone, for example. How, how do they contribute? How much room do they have to improvise within the, the score as written? Well, the score was written, actually, it was funny because it started, when I first started writing it, I wrote it for my band. It was mm -hmm. for Epistemy, my band, which was a, right out of Hemispheres. My Hemispheres was a 10-piece version of, of Epistemy. So when we did the first workshop of X, Act 1 was done just with the 10 musicians. I always intended to make it for orchestra, but I always wanted to have those 10 musicians as part of the project because I, I I wanted to bring in that the immediacy and the uh, of the improvisation as part of how the opera sounds. So every performance will be different. So I had I had a, a number of musicians who I'd worked with for periods of time, and they and they were they were in the opera uh, in '86. Now it was kind of doing it now. Uh, now it, it was it had to be a a new group of musicians. And that was exciting to discover new people. And Amir, uh, I met Amir because Amir, uh, I'm, I'm his mentor through, with Opera America for his opera. Oh, wow. And I heard some of his music and I said, wait a second. No, he should play. Uh, so I, I asked Amir, you know, because he wanted to learn more about opera. How would you like to be in the pit of the Met <laughs> and you can play solo trumpet 
in the opera. And, and he was really, he was excited about it. It was great. And it was great to work with him. It strikes me that one additional wrinkle in writing for opera, and this is your 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 first opera, but you've written many since then. <laughs> you've won the Pulitzer Prize for writing one, for example. Um, and that's a particular wrinkle in the Met is that, of course, the singers are unamplified. Right. And the Met is a famously acoustically complicated room to try to be in. Yes, it's hard. Jazz is traditionally not played under an unamplified singer. Uh, uh, How do you think about arrangement in a way that it can accommodate the operatic voice that the voice can carve through the music or sit on top of it or whatever and not be swallowed up uh, in it? Well, that's a great question. And that's a very hard thing. The acoustic balance is very hard. So one of the things is I try to use strings and other things under voices and different sections of it. I mean, they they have to play much softer than they usually play. And it's something like Duke Ellington always was able to do. Duke Ellington's orchestra could play so soft. Yeah, and totally. So, so pretty. It was unbelievable how they could you know, and still sound beautiful and blended. Uh, so you have to you have to think of it that way, you know, and then then there are other moments where I, you know, I don't use all those instruments or I use them in the spaces, in the spaces around the voice. So for example, Louisa's aria, which she starts a kind of recitative and she sings, and there's a trombone improvisation that weaves in and out. So so she goes, Earl should have been home by sunset. And then he's just doing these sounds. But I'm always aware of trying not to cover the voice, you know, when I'm thinking about it. But it's hard. That's one one hard aspect of it. Also because using drums is the main thing which covers the voice. Right. So sometimes I, I would actually leave the drums out for periods of time and have it come in in again when where when it when it's really needed mm-hmm. and then not have it, you know, play all the time. Yeah. Right. Malcolm X, Amistad. Central Park Five, you know, obviously you are a political artist. There's a political soul, you know, within your work. How do you think of that in terms of music composition? Because obviously the libretto is doing a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, you know, like, and you could sort of like let it do that. But I, I have to imagine because you're drawn to this subject matter that as a composer, there's a part of you, that political soul is part of your composition process. And I'm just wondering how you think about that as you work through. Well, it's really part of who I am because I yeah. was I was very interested when I, when I was in high school, even going back to the 10th grade, that 10th grader, I was very fascinated by politics and really interested. And in fact, my I thought if you'd asked me then, I would say I was going to be a lawyer and a Work in civil rights. That's what I was going to do. Okay, so I was very passionate about it. Something I thought. Then I realized when I was in college, but I started to realize that maybe my role was to do activism through music. How can you do activism through music? And I, I remember starting when I, when I was a freshman at Yale was when the Bobby Seal trial happened mm-hmm. in New Haven. So I wrote this piece, May Day, but but wasn't the May Day like you know, it's spring and it's beautiful flowers and all that shit. May Day was about re- revolution and stuff. Right. <laughs> May know, the so, first, not yeah, uh, May, May, May yeah. first. Yeah. I remember it was in 15. I wrote this weird, and it was a very powerful piece in it. And, and I, it was fun, a way of kind of capturing, you know, what that revolutionary spirit mm-hmm. is. The, that, to find that energy, that spark, that thing right. that, that stirs you. You know, and that's something uh, that I, I I was drawn to early, and then when opera, I find almost an ideal way to to work in that fear. You know, like Malcolm's story, for example, mm-hmm. or or the Amistad, or in a f- comic way, Tanya, which was about P- Patty Hearst kidnapping. Right. You know, so I so I try, I, 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 but I find those things they're they're fascinating to me because there's a they're always a conjunction of culture. And politics, mm-hmm. where those meet, is very uh, fascinating to me. You know, like uh, Central Park Five, for example, 
the when that when it happened was 1989 right. and all the newspapers say they were wilding in the park right mm -hmm. and where does that come from it becomes they were singing wild thing huh. song when they were in the park wow took it to the hotel she said you're the king so be my queen if you know what i mean and let's do the wild thing wilding came out of wild thing so this idea of this anxiety about the arrival of hip-hop becoming mainstream was something i think a cultural moment i mean like also spike lee's do the right thing capture. yeah of course yeah, and that was the same year, and that was 1989 as well. So right. when, I, when I think they were putting those five in jail, and prior to implicate those five, they were imp they were almost they, they were trying to put Radio Rahim in jail. Yeah, totally, totally. And so, so I, so I felt so that so that 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 means a collision of how the culture is changing, mu the music world and the political world, and the emergence of Trump. Trump is also that was his emergence as a political figure. Right, those big full page ads, right? Exactly. That he took out exactly. About, exactly. Put them to death or whatever. Yes. Yeah. And, and that was that was the beginning of his political career, I really think. And mm -hmm. and so so in a way to talk about that danger of that, which is lurks behind that, and the demonizing of, of African American youth. Yeah. That's so much part of the kind of right wing rhetoric. Yeah. Totally. When you are between projects or, or finished with the thing or whatever, what do you do to creatively recharge? <laughs> or are you someone who's just immediately on to the next thing? You got 30 no, things I, going I'm on. Not, I'm not, not, no sleep yeah. for the weary. You no, know. I like, I like, uh, I watch sports. <laughs> oh. I'm a big, big sports junkie. I, I, you know, basketball particularly, mm. you know. What's your team? Knicks. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the Knicks, and uh, you know, so so I I used to go to Knicks games when I was in their eighties. You know, when it was mm -hmm. they were Patrick Ewing with, and they played the the Bulls or something with Michael Jordan. Yeah. So that was a very exciting time, you know. But but I and my and my son is a professional athlete too, so he's a he's a baseball player. So, right. So I've been to a lot of baseball games too. Amazing. Well, Anthony Davis, thank you so much for joining us to talk about your process. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. Up next, Isaac and I will talk about artistic pivots, letting the world influence our work, and the practicalities of remixing and repurposing ideas from other projects. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right. New music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. Isaac, that was an inspiring conversation. I loved your first questions about how Anthony, who has been writing music since his teens, made a shift toward setting language to music for the stage. A lot of artists have to navigate a similar pivot. You did, Isaac, when you switched from being a theatre director to writing cultural history. I wonder, what was the most important thing you learned when you made that switch? Well, I mean, there's all sorts of craft stuff I learned, of course. But the thing that I really want to say, particularly for listeners who are considering a career or field change within the arts, is that I really had to learn to not be embarrassed by my past. You know, mm -hmm. I went to grad school. I was older than almost everyone else there. And they had read all this canonical 
creative nonfiction and sort of fiction that's popular in the MFA world. And I'd read very little of it, you know, mm-hmm. because I'd read a lot of plays and yeah. I, I mean, I've read a lot of novels. I'm a well-read person, but you know, yeah. there's specific things that most people in an MFA program had read. I hadn't read any of them, you know, and it took me a while to learn to a, just write down something when they mentioned that they read it and, you know, go read it. That's a, mm-hmm. that's a big thing. You can catch up. And the other was to take the tools that I had developed as a director and adapt them to writing, right? So Mm. as a director, I'm always thinking about dramatic action and structure. And both of those things are really important when it comes to writing. And those are things that aren't always emphasized in an MFA program, right? So while I might not have been diagramming and crafting beautiful (laughs) sentences since I was 12 or whatever, I knew how to get a reader interested in a piece and keep that interest going until the end, which is no small, you know, thing to be good at in this day and age of maximal distraction. No kidding. I was fascinated by Anthony's observations about picking things up from the street, you know, hearing conversations, non-human sounds, and allowing that to feed his work as a composer. We've talked quite a bit in recent episodes about using all our senses, including hearing, in our creative work. But I'm curious specifically about how you experience the influence of walking around Brooklyn. Do overheard conversations or cool turns of phrase ever make it into your work? It's a little challenging to do that because I write nonfiction, right? (laughs) Um, Cool turns of phrase definitely do. But, uh, you know, I recently read um, this wonderful biography of August Wilson by uh, Patty Hardigan, who's an arts journalist based out of Philadelphia. And one of the things that August Wilson did all the time is, you know, he wrote in diners and coffee shops and he would just constantly be talking to people and overhearing conversations. And that would really inform his writing on a really profound level, right? Because he was, you know, taking the vernacular and, and weaving it into this beautiful kind of spoken poetry. I can't do that because I I can't make things up, right? But uh, I do think it's important to grow and expand as an artist and to not rely on the same old tricks. And as a writer, that means, you know, when you see a word that you really like in a book, you you write it down, you read it, you know, you try to use it in a few sentences so you can learn how to embody that word, you know, Mm. so that's there in you. Uh, I can think of one word in the method, adumbrations, which I had never used before, you know, Um, but You know, like, so like the method, uh, my last book is filled with references to Hamlet. Sometimes they're underlined, you know, sometimes it's like, this is a reference to Hamlet. And sometimes it's just, I've used a quote from Hamlet without telling you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, the last paragraph of the book has this little thing about Hamlet in it. Right. Mm -hmm. So it all sort of comes together in that last paragraph of the book. That's a trick you can do once. You know what I mean? It's like (laughs) for my next book, it's like, not only is there no Hamlet references in it, there probably have to be zero Shakespeare references in it because I can't just keep going back to the old. Well, um, really cool, interesting stylistic stuff that you do. If you do it too often becomes a tick, you know? And so one of the ways to avoid that is to walk around Brooklyn without your headphones on and listen to what people say or read books that are totally outside your comfort zone or, you know, whatever it is, and just try to absorb new things. Yeah. So I am both in awe of and envious of Anthony for his ability to do something he mentioned in a couple of answers, which is taking music that he composed for one project and repurposing it for another. In awe because that reveals he has decades of music in his head that he can pull from. It reminds me of how we talked once about how really, truly great athletes remember in great detail, Mm -hmm. like the different points in a game that they played a long time ago, blah, blah. Like that just feels amazing. But also the act of repurposing and reintegrating just is one of those examples of how really talented artists can make something that is just astonishingly difficult seem relatively easy. Uh, Some academics, and to use a term, I know you hate Isaac, content creators, are dedicated to the concept of the Zettelkasten, which is kind of a collection of ideas that can be remixed and repurposed to make the process of writing academic papers or other nonfiction more efficient. That's the dream anyway. Isaac, I'm curious if you have any sort of filing system for ideas independent of the specific project you're working on at any given time. All right. I just have to, because you mentioned it, 
briefly say I do hate the term content creators because it flattens the difference between artists and non-artists and, you know, someone writing a novel and someone writing an advertisement are doing two different things for two different purposes and that difference has meaning and value. All right, now that that's said... um, (laughs) My thing is actually dumping all of the thoughts unlabeled into a, a very long notes app. Ooh. And I that probably gives you high levels of anxiety to hear that I'm, I do. I've got highs, actually. But part of it is actually, I think there is some value in that messiness, in mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. you know, unconventional connections between things start to form. Because you're not yeah. tagging them and saying, oh, the connection between these things is this. You're actually just saying, these are all ideas. And then they, you know, smash into each other and and, and out of that, like a spark flies, right? Yeah. Um, and so I do think that messiness has value. That said, as I age... Uh, I, I seriously, and my brain, you know, gets slowly worse and worse. Uh, I worry that I'm going to just lose stuff in that deluge. Uh, so I probably do need to come up with some system like Zettelkasten, but you know, like we've talked about it on previous episodes Mm -hmm. and it does seem sort of like a lot of busy work. Like, like it's like filing, which I, you know, which you normally pay a temp to do, but you have to do it uh, like a filing for your hippocampus for something or something like that. Am I, am I wrong? It just seems like a really unpleasant task. That's just busy work. Well, it can be. It, it, there are some people who definitely get so wrapped up in having the perfect Zettelkasten that they get lost in the busy work. And I agree with you that there's some value in messiness. The whole idea is to have ideas rubbing against each other, you know, in close proximity, and you can connect those dots in different ways. So, yeah, there's trial and error in figuring out what suits your way of thinking, your way of working. I think when you do kind of find a good method, though... It can be really useful. I'm a I'm a fan. Um, but to get back to Anthony Davis, um, as you said at the beginning of the interview, X was first performed in 1986 and then it's been back at the Met just recently. Uh, one of the great things about the performing arts is the way that shows that were developed decades ago or, you know, in the opera repertoire or, of course, the, the theatrical repertoire hundreds of years ago. They can return to the stage for us to experience in whatever political or cultural moment they land in. Technology, of course, has made it easier than ever to return to old movies, albums and books. Is there a book or movie or a piece of music from another decade that has seemed extra relevant to you of late? That's interesting. You know, relevance is such a weird metric, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like just to give an example, I recently read Pushkin's Eugene Onegin, right, which is one of the first novels written in the Russian language by the sort of originator and greatest figure of Russian literature. And I'm not going to say that this story of a guy who kills his best friend in a duel over a girl feels particularly relevant to our day and age, but it's <laughs> so rich and strange and funny because Pushkin's Pushkin is making the rules of the novel up while he's writing it. You know, like there Mm -hmm. is no template for him to work from. And there's so much originality and playfulness there that is harder to find when you're reading stuff written even 50 years later when the conventions are are hardened, you know, or I recently saw a stage reading of two early Sam Shepard one acts, Uh, you know, Sam relevance was not what Sam Shepard was interested in, (laughs) Um, especially in these early plays, which are, you know, written often in one draft, often under the influence of drugs. They have a real uh, dream like logic to them and they just make you feel sort of more awake to the world around you and they're entertaining in this raw really wild way that you know our current system which produces lots of great theater but it doesn't have a lot of room for that kind of work yeah that's it while we're talking theater a play i return to every couple of years is maxim gorky's children of the sun which is not a very well-known play of his i mean most people if they know gorky they know the lower depths which among people including kurosawa have adapted to the screen he wrote this play right before the failed 1905 revolution in russia uh andrew upton who is married to kate blanchett did a translation adaptation of it that is amazing and i read that every couple of years because it just feels newly relevant all of the time it is you know in its story of wealthy aristocrats pursuing what they think is the common good but in doing so are actually poisoning the world around them wow uh you actually also have just reminded me of when the royal court theater in london was celebrating its 50th anniversary and they did stage readings of some of the plays 
that had had their debut there over those oh, amazing. first five decades. And I went to a reading of an early play by Hanif Qureshi, and it was fascinating, not because of its relevance, mm. but because it revealed how much things had changed in Britain since it was written. You know, some of those changes were political, some were demographic. You had these British East Asian actors basically talking like their parents, I mean, in terms of their accents, or, you know, maybe even at that stage, their grandparents, because the characters were immigrants, which is less of a reality with that particular segment of the British population these days. And it really hit me, but basically as a sign of how much Britain had changed since it was first produced. So I very much take your point that timing isn't always about relevance. So thank you. All right, listeners, we hope you have enjoyed the show. If you have, remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. That way you will never miss an episode. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you'll get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on some Slate shows, and you will never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. Thank you so much to Anthony Davis and to our wonderful producer, Cameron Drews, who makes this podcast sing. We'll be back next week with June's conversation with biographer Adam Sisman. Until then, get back to work. Every day my employees get scam emails. I wanted to protect my business and clients, so I checked out CISA's Secure Our World. They've got four simple ways we can protect our businesses from online threats. Learn more at cisa.gov forward slash secure our world.